Now, we're, we're in the second of five warnings in this chapter that we'll go through. Last week it was beware of hypocrisy. This week it is beware of covetousness. And uh, it's interesting, the, the stage is set by these two brothers. Evidently, they haven't listened to verses 1 to 12. They've been aggravated in the crowd the whole time. They're thinking, you know, okay, he's given a great teaching on hypocrisy, but we got this problem we want to bring to him, you know. And you can see them arguing. And as soon as Jesus takes a breath between sentences, it seems they're butting in and say, Lord, you know, settle this thing up between me and my brother. We're fighting over the inheritance. And how an inheritance can be, you know, something that puts people at odds. We've, we've had to mediate and, and talk with people in the church here whose hearts are broken, you know. Let the, let the parents die or Uncle Fred passes off the scene or something and immediately you have people who've been together for years saying, I can't believe that, you know, why did he give the tools to him? He never worked a day in his life. He's a bum. He promised he was going to leave the tools to me. Give him a roll of tape. He don't know what the tool, you know, what does he do with tools? Or I can't believe Mom gave the picture over to Mantle to Susan. She promised a picture to me and you know I know what they did she when she was sane she told me I could have it but she got senile before she died and they got her in a lawyer's office and they changed the will and you know it's amazing to see how people you know the, the, and, and then for years there will be heartache between them and bitterness over stuff over stuff and these two guys come to, to Jesus. Or we don't know if they ever get settled. They may have gone away, been mad till they died. We don't know. But they come to Jesus and they say, Lord, and, and a rabbi may, might have gotten involved in this. You see, in the Old Testament, uh, Moses appointed 70 to help him rule over the nation. And the civil and religious leaders were both in one. They, they would help in problems where the, an inheritance was involved and so forth. But these two guys come to Jesus arguing, and they say, Lord, settle this up between us. My brother's jipping me. And, and the Lord says, man, who, who may be ruler and divider over you? And he turns to the people and says, beware of covetousness, because the quality of a man's life doesn't consist in the abundance of the things that he possesses. And just like Jesus, what he does is he puts his finger right on the issue and he's basically saying to them, the, the difficulty here is not equity. You're not going to be happy if this gets settled in a fair way. Whatever decision I make, somebody's going to be aggravated. The problem in the situation is covetousness. It is not fairness. Because there's part of man... The soulish part of man is never satisfied with the material where there is desire and lust and greed and covetousness, and it's never settled. Now, it's interesting as we look at this commandment in the law, and you have to turn there, the last commandment of the Ten Commandments says, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maid servant, you can write in there dishwasher, garbage disposal, refrigerator, freezer, nor his ox, Volvo, I don't know, or his burrow, or anything of your neighbors. And and it's very interesting that, that the Ten Commandments end with this commandment because it is radically different from all of the other commandments and in, and incorporates them really if you take the first commandment on the first table i am the lord thy god thou shalt have no other gods before me and you take the last commandment on the second table that deals with with social man's relationship with man thou shalt not covet everything else in between them kind of falls in as details and the interesting thing about this last commandment is you see <clears throat> it basically says god desires to be God of the desire of the heart also. God wants to be the God of your desires. You see, because it said thou shalt not steal. Well, you could rob somebody's house and it's very evident that you're a thief. You get caught, you get prosecuted. Or you can commit adultery and that's something that man recognizes and, and sees. 
or thou shalt not commit murder, literally it says there. <clears throat> and of course, if you're guilty of that crime, it's evident to all. But the interesting thing about covetousness is we can all do it all week and nobody sees but God. It's a sin that God identifies and born out of covetousness is the reason we steal, the reason we commit adultery, the reasons we might murder, the reasons we might turn after other gods. It's an interesting commandment to sum up the law with because of how radically different it is than the rest because it deals not with outward action but with the motivation of the heart. And Jesus says, not to unbelievers, why would an unbeliever listen to a warning about covetousness? First, why would they listen to it? Well, why would they care? This is is to believers. Uh, Look out. It's literally continually be on the lookout for covetousness because he knows our nature. It's something that would continually trouble us. The desire for more, literally, it's, it's the covetous is the words that means to want more. And society plays on that. I mean, you have to realize a hundred years ago, if you lived in an agrarian society, you went out in the morning, you worked in the field with your family, you looked in the face of your kids, you got to know them, who they were, you came back, you were hungry from working all day, you sat at the table, you ate dinner, after dinner it got dark. There was no television, there was no telephone, there was no fax machine, uh, you were tired, your belly was full, you went to sleep at 8 o'clock, you woke up in the morning, you were healthy. You And now, of course, covetousness is part of our society. You've got it piped in on the television. You've got television shopping. They've got the catalogs coming in the mail. you got guys coming to your house knocking on the front door. I mean, if you have a weak moment, you're going to own a juicer and be in debt. You know, just <laughs> the, the society is, is uh, it's geared towards this part of man, this covetous part of man. It's geared towards it in many ways, advertisers. And we're never satisfied. I heard a story about a guy that uh, pulled up at a, at a stoplight in his Rolls Royce and uh, happened to look out the window, and there was a guy sitting next to him in a little sports car with smoke glass windows, and he had the window down, and a little guy in a sports car is kind of laughing at him, and he rolls down his window and looks at him, and the guy in a sports car says, you think you're pretty hot, don't you, in a Rolls Royce? And he said, well, look, just, let's be honest. You've got a sports car, I've got a Rolls Royce. And he said, well, he said, you got a telephone in that thing? And the guy in a Rolls Royce said, yeah, he held it up, i got a telephone. The other guy said, well, i got one too. He said, uh, you got a TV in that thing? And the guy in a Rolls Royce said, as a matter of fact, I do have a television here. And he said, well, i got one here, too. He said, it has a sports car. He said, yep. He said, you got a fax machine in there? And the guy in a Rolls Royce said, well, yes, yeah, as a matter of fact, I do. He said, well, I've got one in here, too. He said, that's pretty amazing. He said, you got a double bed in there? <laughs> the guy in a Rolls Royce said, no, no, I don't. He was a little bothered. And the guy in a sports car said, ha, I got one in here, and he zoomed away. And the guy's sitting there steaming. He's fuming. He said, well, you know, I got the most expensive car in the world. And he he just ate him. He couldn't take it. So he went to this custom shop, and they designed a way to put this bed in there for him, you know. And when it was all done, he went looking for this guy in a sports car. You know, it just was, I'm going to find this guy. I'm going to show him, aggravated, you know. So he pulls up, and he sees the sports cars parked by the side of the road. And uh, and, uh, he pulls over. He said, oh, and he starts banging on the window. He doesn't know if he's, he's thinking, well, maybe the guy's in a building or somewhere, and, and uh, as he's banging, finally the, the window rolls down. A guy says, what do you want? And he said, you remember me? I look familiar. He said, yeah. He said, I'm the guy with the Rolls Royce. He said, yeah. And he said, well, you know what? He said, what? He said, I got a queen-size bed in my Rolls Royce. <laughs> and the guy in the sports car said, you got me out of the shower to tell me that? <laughs> the fourth time I told it. It's still funny. <laughs> it's a great picture of the human race. Now, there isn't anything wrong with wanting things, and the Bible has a lot to say about our responsibility towards our, our, our wives, our families, our husbands, our to be prudent and to be diligent and to work and to provide. And the Bible does not prohibit 
prosperity. Abraham was a prosperous man and God's friend. David was a prosperous man and a man after God's own heart. Um, Lydia was prosperous in the New Testament, ran her own business. Uh, Solomon was the richest man that ever lived. But covetousness comes to play when we begin to desire our neighbor's home or our neighbor's wife or our neighbor's something that the Bible prohibits. When we set our affection on something that is transgressing God's revealed will, we have stepped into an arena where it's wrong. You may look at a friend of yours may have a fishing rod you admire. It's not wrong to admire. You can go out and buy one and you can have the same one. There's nothing wrong with that. But when, when we transgress in our desires something that we know that God has laid out for us, or when our behavior is determined by something we want rather than by God's revealed will in Scripture, now we're into the realm of covetousness. If we desire a relationship so much, we compromise in it and do something we shouldn't. If we desire something so much that we lie or cheat as in regards to money, if we transgress God's will and we're determining our behavior by something we want, now we've moved into the realm of covetousness. And it tells us in Colossians 3, 5 that covetousness is idolatry. And the idea is you've, you've switched gods. No longer is Jesus Christ and the scripture determining how you act and how you respond and how you behave. But this thing or this person that you want, you want it to such a degree and you've convinced yourself that if you have this thing, you'll be satisfied and you're determining your behavior by that, now it is covetousness, it's lust, it's greed. We've moved into an area that we should not be in. And advertisers understand that there's that part of man that is like that. Now, if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ personally, you need to listen up because you've got to determine what are you doing with your life? Where are you going? Where is it, where is it headed? What are you going to accumulate to yourself that's going to satisfy you? Or maybe you're trying to escape something in the past, or maybe it's a combination of both. For the believer, I think the warning is, look, we live in a materialistic Society, America is, is a, an illusion when we look at Rwanda and Yugoslavia and what's going on in the rest of the world. And one of our problems in America is because we're sinners, because there's social injustice, because there's uh, discrimination, because there's all kinds of things wrong within society itself. And yet the same catalog comes to the poor guy's house as comes to the millionaire's house. The same uh, television shopping program it comes into the living room of the guy who's in poverty as it comes into the rich man's. The, the poor guy drives by the same Volvo dealership or Mercedes-Benz dealership that the rich guy drives by, and all of it comes to bear on the, the, this part inside of man, that is, tr and he's trying to fulfill himself with drugs or alcohol or success or money or pleasure or all these other things. And in the unbeliever, it's that drive, that desire, that covetousness. He doesn't recognize it for what, he, for what it is, and he's trying to fill himself with that. Jesus says that the, the quality of life that we're looking for doesn't find its source in the abundance of things that we possess, but it, that quality of life that man is searching for finds its source with God and with his kingdom. And yet, I think of how the, the faith confessors, the positive confessors, play upon man's covetousness, a believer's covetousness. Uh, the Bible tells us, freely you have received, therefore freely give. The reason you should give is because Jesus Christ came to you. You didn't deserve nothing. You were bankrupt spiritually, morally, and he saved you, and he washed you, and he cleansed you. He's given you life. He's made you appreciate your family, your friends. The only reason you could be thankful for a sandwich is because you can look at heaven and put it in relationship to God. You can look at Rwanda. You can look at what's going on. You can be thankful. You can own something. And because God has given you the ability to, to possess the things that are in your life because you weigh them in light of God and you're thankful for them be, because you freely have received that you should freely give. Whereas the faith confessors turn it around and play on man's covetousness and say that you should give to get. They turn the motivation around. You should give 10% so you get the 
said, you can have a Mercedes, you can have a plane, you should have, you know, and, and they play on man's sinful side. And, and it turns out that it, none of it is ever really giving anyway, because God looks at the motivation of the heart. And the only reason there's any giving is because is then you're going to run out your front lawn and wait for God to open the windows of heaven. <laughs> and it's not giving at all. And that covetous side of man is continually played upon in a million different circumstances. It's part of our fallen nature. And when God says thou shalt not covet, he gets beyond our actions down to the desires of our heart and challenges. You see, it's very easy for me (coughs) when I struggle in my own relationship with the Lord in, in, in my selfishness or in my anger, or in my lust, or, you know, in, as a man. It's easy to relax in those areas because nobody sees what's going on inside. I mean, would you want me to take what's going on inside your heart this last week and put it up on a big movie screen for everybody to see? You know, can you get the idea? So Jesus is, really puts his finger down on the issue and says, I want to be God of your desires also. Beware of covetousness. Paul said, you know, as a Pharisee and as a Jew, he said, I had fulfilled the law. I was blameless. That's quite a thing to say in Romans chapter 7. He said, except that last commandment. Oh, I wish there was nine of them. That last one was a killer. And he said, the law is good, but sin, taking advantage by the law, revealed itself in me. And when I read, thou shalt not covet, I realized that I was flawed. Oh, I hadn't committed adultery, and I hadn't stolen anything, and I hadn't worshipped any other gods, so I thought. But inside my heart were these cravings, these things that were not right. And I realized when I read the law saying, thou shalt not covet, that I had sinned against God. That's why Jesus said, You have heard it hath been said of them of old, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, If you lust after a woman, you have already committed adultery in your heart. You have heard it hath been said of them of old, Thou shalt not you know, murder. But I say to you, If you are angry with your brother, You think, I'd like to slug this guy. It's already in your heart. He tells this parable now to illustrate the idea that that part of man is never satisfied. It says, the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. He thought within himself. Now, in verse 17, 18, and 19, there are six eyes, five mys, and some mycels and thines and stuff. It's amazing. Let's read through these three verses. He thought within himself, saying, what shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow my fruits and my stuff. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease and eat, drink, and be merry. I mean, look, here's a guy the world would have looked at and said, This guy's got life by the tail. He's industrious. He's diligent. uh, He's prospering. He's the kind of guy that's a model. You want to be like, and yet this guy for all his getting has no rest. For all his getting, his problem now has become he got no place to put his stuff. He's got too much stuff. I remember before I was saved years ago when I was a hippie, I had my stuff in a bag that I kept on my shoulder. All my worldly stuff. When my shoes weren't on my feet, they were in there. I won't explain the rest of my situation, but life was simpler. Then I get married. I get saved and I get married. But my wife likes hotels. So I can't hitchhike around the country anymore with a bag over my shoulder. (laughs) And then you start to settle into life, and then you get a house, which is a place where you keep your stuff. (laughs) Well, I used to be anti-establishment when I was a hippie. Now I need the police to guard my stuff. (laughs) In fact, when we moved in the fall, we went up into the attic, and we had stuff in boxes we hadn't unpacked from the last time we moved. I had to open up to see what kind of stuff it was. That's, I think, why it's called stuff, because you stuff it everywhere when you move. It's just stuff. 
Well, this guy, his problem, he's not satisfied for all the stuff he has. Now he needs a bigger place to keep his stuff. So he says, I'm going to build bigger barns. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And then I'm going to say to my soul, soul, (laughs) this guy's schizophrenic too. I'm going to say to my soul, soul, you have much goods. He was wrong. His soul didn't have any of this stuff. Laid up for many years. The Lord was going to require his life that day. It wasn't for many years. That was presumption. But interesting to me, he says, take thine ease. He was not at rest. He's trying to convince his soul to be at rest at this point in his life. And he's prosperous. He's got all this stuff. This guy is not happy. That's why we watch TV. We see guys that are in the NFL. They're making $10 million in three years, and they're busted for cocaine. Because they're not $10 million bucks. ain't going to satisfy you. If you don't know Jesus Christ this morning, what is going to satisfy you? Where's your life going? What are you living towards? What do you think you're going to accumulate to yourself that's going to give you peace? I know it would be nice to try $10 million bucks. But we know it doesn't satisfy. We see millionaires in rehab centers. What's this world going to give you to satisfy the gnawing that's inside? Just think about that. This guy's telling his soul, soul, relax. Take thine ease. The answer comes from God. God said unto him, thou fool, this night... Now, the King James says, thy soul shall be required of thee. It's interesting. The original language says, this night do they require thy soul. Now, it bothers me. Who are they? (laughs) I'm glad I ain't going to see them because I'm saved. But I was curious about who they are. The Bible talks about the tormentors. Scary idea. This night do they require thy soul. Then... Who shall those things be that thou hast provided? He thought he was keeping them. He was just providing them for somebody else. Solomon says, again, the richest man that ever lived. I I, I had the best bands in the world come into my living room. I had, uh, you know, 700 wives and 300 concubines. I had the best wine in the world. I was bored with everything. I got peacocks. I got apes. All of it's vanity. It all drove me nuts. And none of it satisfied the soul. And then you realize you're a billionaire. When you die, you, you die, you leave your money to some sap, and he squanders it. And it was never yours anyway. It's just time sharing. Here's these two brothers arguing over the picture from the mantle, and they're going to die. They're just getting it from somebody who just died. They're going to argue over it, and they're going to keep it till they die to pass it on to somebody else to argue over. The Lord says, thou fool. Now, when we read fool in the Bible again, I don't know where we're going to finish this. A fool in the Bible is not a fool like we hear today. The Bible, a fool is a man who says in his heart, there is no God. And because of that, there's no sense of accountability. He doesn't need to learn. He doesn't need to be instructed. He doesn't need to be corrected. As we study through the book of Proverbs, the fool was the man who could not receive correction or instruction. The wise man was the man who didn't have a high IQ, but he realized he needed correction. He realized he needed instruction and he received the instruction of the wise he listened that was the wise person in the bible the bible says a fool has said in his heart that there is no god i'm going to read a few psalms for you to give you an idea about the brevity of life it says lord make me to know my end and to measure my days what it is that i may know how frail i am Behold, thou hast made my days as a handbreadth, and my age is as nothing before thee. Verily, every man at his best state altogether is vanity. Surely every man walks in a vain show. Surely they are disquieted in vain, and he heapeth up riches, and knoweth not who shall gather them. Again, the Psalms tell us this. The days of our years are threescore years and ten, seventy years. And if by reason of strength they are fourscore, eighty years, yet is their strength labor and sorrow. For it is soon cut off and we fly away. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. It says the average life expectancy of man is seventy years. If you live to be eighty, it's because 
Because of strength. God's given you a stronger frame. You know, I watch these TV shows. A guy lives to be 120. He says, because he eats yogurt every day. Everybody goes out and buys yogurt. Another old Italian guy says, I live to be 120 because I drank wine and smoked cigars every day. So everybody gets wine and cigars. You know, the Bible says here, you're, look, your life expectancy is 70. If you live to be 80 because you had a stronger frame, what does it amount to? You work 10 more years before you die. <laughs> So teach us to number our days. Again, the Psalms say, for, as man, for man, his days are as the grass, as the flower of the field. So he flourishes, for the wind passeth over it, and it is gone, and the place thereof knoweth it no more. James in the New Testament basically tells us the same thing when he says, let the brother of low degree, that's struggling, the poor brother, rejoice in that he is exalted. The idea is in Christ. But let the rich man exalt in that he is made low. He realizes he's just a sinner saved by grace, no better than any other man. The reason? Because as the flower of the grass, he shall, he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but the, it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth. So also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. And the, the idea is here, Jesus is saying, look out for covetousness, because the quality of life that man is after does not find its source in the abundance of things that he possesses and he tells the story of a rich man who had it all and is still trying to convince his soul to rest and then when that man dies and other people look and say man he this is shame he lost everything well Jesus says no what's it's not a shame what he left behind it's a shame what was ahead of him because it says so is every man that layeth up for himself and is not rich toward God there's a play on words the idea is you know you're laying up are you living toward self or are you living toward God? That is the question. And covetousness comes to play. Are you living toward yourself? What are you going to accumulate in life? What are you going to get? What's going to keep you alive more than 70 years? What's going to matter to you when you're laying on the, your, your deathbed? Or are you living towards God? Are you spending yourself and your energies and your resources with God in mind? Are you living your life with God in mind? Are you looking forward to that day that's coming? I appreciate a certain quality of life, but it's going to go by like that, the things I appreciate in this world. How many of you are over 50 years old here? Be honest. Come on. Too many. How many of you are over 60? Over 70? How fast did it go? Like that. Well, I'm 44. That means I got a half of one of these left. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? But I appreciate a quality of life that does not find its source in the material. When I look at what's going on in Rwanda, and I realize there are believers that are under those terrible circumstances, when I think of a Rwandan mother who is Christian, who has watched her husband die and her children die, and who has one little kid left who's hanging on and maybe being nursed back to health by the Red Cross, and she sees flesh coming on that kid's face again and can hold that kid's head in her hand and look and think that kid's going to live, you know, to her, she realizes that the quality of life she appreciates does not come from the abundance of things that she possesses, but she appreciates a quality of life because she can look in the face of her kids. When I hold my kid and I look at my kid's face, I'll tell you what matters to me. When I lay on my deathbed, I don't care if that kid is a carpenter or a president of the United States or a trash collector. If he can say to me, Dad, I know Jesus Christ, and I close my eyes, and I know I'm going to see him again, I appreciate that quality of life. I appreciate the quality of life when I read the Bible says thou shalt not covet and I know my heart's full of it. I appreciate the quality of life that came to earth and left this place in glory and loved me so much that it stretched out his hands on a cross and bled there that I can live. I appreciate that quality of life. I appreciate the quality of life that has given me an ability to see past the grave into glory and that one day I'm going to stand in the Lord's presence forgiven and washed. I appreciate that quality of life. We're going to stand there in heaven and, you know, I look at your faces every week and I lost track of you at about 300. But I know I'm not worried because our relationship is just beginning. In a million years we'll say, hey, we look at each other every week. Let's talk. Let's get to know each other. we got all the time in the world. And when we stand in eternity, we're going to look back on this earth and you're going to say, I can't believe I was bummed out for two years 
years because I couldn't get that snowmobile. I must have been a, a lunatic, you know. I mean, just think of what it'll be like. And, the, and Jesus is saying, look out for covetousness. It robs from you. It helps you. It keeps you from remembering what life is all about. God wants us to have good things. He wants us to be responsible. But there comes a point in life when we set our affections on things of the earth and start to believe that if we have them, we'll be happy and we can make a God out of them. You know that uh, R- William Randolph Hearst forbid the word death to be spoken in the Hearst mansion. He, forgid, he forbid the word death to be mentioned around him. Didn't help. <laughs> he died. If you don't know Jesus Christ this morning, the, 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 the thing you're hungering after and thirsting after is a living relationship with the living God. It's a quality of life that you will not discover in drugs or alcohol or the material you're searching in this world. You will never find it. You will never be satisfied. God has you here. You could have never wandered into the mall unless he loved you. You're here because he loves you. Make up your mind now because the Bible says that sometimes the voice says to us, this day your life is required. And the Bible says today is the acceptable day of salvation. Today is the day that you need to make up your mind for Jesus Christ. And you'll discover there's a quality of life that makes life worth living because you can look beyond the grave. It takes away the fear of death. You can look beyond this present world. You realize that your life is all ahead of you. There's nothing behind you. For us that are believers, I think what a challenge to us, to me. That God wants to be the God of my desires. That's convicting. I was convicted this week when I read this, so I'm letting you have it too. Why should I be convicted and you get away? (laughs) He wants to be the God of our desires too, where no other man can see. And have them ordered. Let's stand and pray.